Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this to this session. Uh, it's an honor, pleasure to be to be here. And uh, so today we have a quite special quite special thing. We're going to try to make music live uh, using what is going to be in the next uh, 15 20 minutes the uh, oscillation of the Earth uh, in a specific place in uh, in Yellowstone. I'll show you on the map. And the data will be streamed here, turned in real time into, into music score that we'll email to uh, um, a professional, professional uh, concert flutist and flute professor uh, at the Virginia State, sorry, Fairmont State University in West Virginia, Dr. Lisa Schwartz, uh, who will be playing and will be commenting uh, on the process of creating music and making actual music, um, concert music. From, uh, from science and from, from data. So have you ever seen a child, a young child in particular, playing with a music instrument? Well, what always strikes me is the fact that they, what they do is never try to make actual melodies. Now, that's a grown-up thing. You know, that's, what, that's what we do. They have much more interesting things to do. They try to they hit them, they let them drop from different heights, they try to cook them, put in a dishwasher, in a washing machine, don't ask, uh, jump on them. They, no, they, they try to interact with it in a very different way. And that's wonderful. And the reason why they do that is because children are explorers. They use music as a way to make sense of the word around them, to make sense of the complexity of the word around them. And this is something that at a certain point in our life, we kind of lose. We like, kind of lose the, the idea that music can tell us stories, that sound can tell us something about the world around us. So the reason why we are here, Alice and I, is to reclaim that right of music storytelling. We are here at the conference about technology and network to see how network and technology can help us reclaiming our right to be told stories through music and art. So in other words, we are here to think about how we can convert anything, even rumbles from a volcano that is uh, miles away from here, into a concert piece that we can all listen to. Anything can become, can become music, and I, you know, I would like to try to convince you uh, of that claim. So imagine you are a scientist, you are in your, uh, in your lab and you collect data. Uh, what scientists would normally do, um, they, they, try, they like to plot data, they like to create a visual representation of data. Uh, and you know, imagine you do something like that, uh, and your data is increasing regularly, linearly with time. That's what a scientist would do, but you know, what a musician can do is that, I'm gonna minute, what I can do is probably mapping these values to a music pitch. I can choose a scale and I can do a mapping. So for example, I have 25 and I associate node C, 26 D, 27 E, and so on. Or if you choose a different scale, there would be something slightly different. C, C sharp, for example, E flat, whatever your scale is. The important thing is that once you establish the mapping, then you let the mapping do the magic and tell the story. So in this case, you know, if you're using this kind of mapping, we have a melody whose shape is following exactly the same shape of your data. And if you're trying to play it, we have a melody that follows exactly the same data. Nothing really memorable, I agree with you, but it's because the data is not really memorable and not really, you know, it's not telling us any compelling story. But look at what happens if I make my data a little bit more interesting. For example, in this case, we have like a template that repeats twice. I have my data going up and down two times. This could be, for example, the temperature during the day going up during the day, then down during the night, and then up again next day in exactly the same way. So we have a little bit more story here. We have, we have a little bit more information that we like to, we like to express using music. 
And we do the same mapping, and look at the score. It's beautifully following the same path and the same, uh, the same shape at the data. But most importantly, if you're trying to play it now, the result is much more interesting. The data are telling a much more interesting story because the data are more interesting. So, is this idea new? Well, no, it's more than 400 years old, actually. In, a, 15, in 1619, Johannes Kepler wrote a five book, five volume monumental treatise about the movement of the planets. Uh, the planet set, of course, that he, they knew at the time. Um, and he, it was called Harmonis, the Harmony of the, of the Words. And he, he made an important discovery. He discovered that planets were going around the sun, not in circular orbits, as people thought at that time, but they are drawing an ellipse. They have elliptical orbits, and that meant that planets were accelerating and decelerating. They were changing their velocity during a revolution around the, the sun during the year. So he had to communicate that. And of course, he used mathematics and geometry and drawings. But, the, but his preferred way, his chosen way to share that with people is this. This is a piece of music, are actually fragments. There are seven different fragments. Each of them is the musical equivalent of the story of the velocity of the planet around the sun. So what he did was mapping the velocity to the music pitch. So this, the faster is the planet, the higher is the pitch. By doing so, we have a melody that is carefully representing and showing the actual, his, the actual story of the of the planet around the sun, speeding up and slowing down. So Saturn is speeding up, slowing down. Jupiter is doing the same from a different note because it has a different mass, it's a different baseline. Mars accelerates a bit more and decelerates a bit more. Earth does just a tiny change, a semitone during winter and, and summer. You know, the speed is slightly different. Venus is almost a sphere. So it's almost a circle, so it doesn't really change the velocity. Mercury is wonderful. It has a whole, uh, a whole natural scale going up and then an arpeggio going down. So it accelerates slowly and then decelerates quite quickly. And the last one is the moon. But instead of just me telling you how the music looks like, why don't we listen to that? And so I think it's a good time to introduce my, uh, my uh, co-presenter today, sharing this virtual stage. Um, and I ask Alisa to play the, uh, the seven segments for us. And you know, if you just close your eyes, and I, if, if we ask Alisa to play one of them, just pick one, don't tell us what it is, I'm pretty sure that everybody, just by listening to the story of the planet, we can just identify it. Which one do you think it is? Mars. Mars. See? You know, that's how music can actually help scientists to do, to do science in a different way, but you know, that's, that's it. But you can listen to patterns, we can identify patterns. Our ears are so good at doing that. And that's how music can actually start helping scientists. Imagine a blind scientist can do, can do music investigation, can do science investigation using, using music. Thank you. So, 
music and science have a long-standing close connection. And uh, we, I like the thing that nature is a, what, such a wonderful, as such a wonderful reminder that we almost can't have one without the other. And if I have to think about the place where this is particularly true, my mind goes straight to Yellowstone. So Yellowstone is the oldest US national park. It opens its door in the 1st of March, 1872. It covers two, more than two million acres across three states. And it's a place where color, sound, amazing science and space are all together. So it's a, such a fantastic playground to experiment with art, music, and, and science. And it's, it's amazing because it has a fantastic fauna, like the bison, the grizzly bear, but also it's an enormous, gigantic, active volcano. The entire park is sitting on the active caldera of the Yellowstone volcano. It's one of the largest of the world. And it's not surprising that it contains the largest, one of the largest fraction of uh, active geophysical phenomena of the, of the entire planet. Uh, geysers are probably the most famous thing happening there. This fun rig jets of water and, and steam, this is called steamboat, they all have names. Sounds like a steamboat. And has this very interesting, like, pulsation, like. Another one quite different is called Old Faithful. I like this one. It's also a webcam. There's a link over there. You can actually go and you can see what's, what's doing. And it's called Old Faithful because it erupts almost exactly every 90 minutes. So you can actually go there, sit on a bench, and watch the next eruption. And it's a very different character. So it goes like that. It builds up. Then some smaller jets. And then finally the big one, like a fountain. But if you are there in person, there are something else that are, you know, for me, that are absolutely fascinating. And they're probably not big enough, or not cute enough to make the cards. And there are, you know, things like fumaroles are one of my absolute favorite, but mud pots. So mud pots are simply bubbles. <laughs> it's bubbly mud. It's bubbly because there is steam underneath. But you know, as a musician, you know, I, can't, I can't help being fascinated by the rhythm of these bubbles. And how these, there is something familiar about the way they are. They are bursting and they are popping and they are building up. And there is some, some sort of regular pulsation. And so as a musician, I say, how can we actually make people you know, appreciate that? So together with Alisa and two other researchers, we put together a research project and we submitted that for uh, a, a research permit to, uh, to do um, actual data collection and to create, uh, and to create concert pieces uh, from, uh, from Yellowstone. So a series of music concert uh, pieces form from data collected, collected there. Uh, the permit was approved in 2020 and uh, we're proud to say that this was the first permit approved by the US National Park Service, they actually recognized music as a legitimate research output. That was something you know, quite, you know, quite amazing. Um, and so how this, you know, how this project works? You know, how, you know, what do we do? Well, we start from a different way of you know, collecting data. This is microphones. Uh, we also have a sensors like accelerometers, uh, infrasonic microphones. Uh, and this is the, you know, the typical starting point, a waveform. Uh, this is a waveform of a pre-eruption and then eruption. So a like, geyser that is about to erupt and then the, uh, the big fountain and the, and the burst. And how do we go from this to, to music? Well, there are different ways. 
a more like literal way. This is like a Kepler way. And that's also what we're going to do, what you're going to use today. Uh, and it's essentially just imagining to take the wafer, put on an empty music score, overlay it with notes, and then what you have is a melody that is following exactly the beats and the throughs of the, um, of your graph. This is a very general thing. That's what Kepler did with the, with the graph of the, um, uh, of, the, of the velocity of the planet. Or you can do something more sophisticated, and that's what I, what I did for the, for the geezer, for example, which is uh, using the, uh, the, mapping the distance between the peak to music, to note duration, I can say, for example, when, there are, when the notes are, when the peaks are closer to each other, are clustered together, I have faster notes. And when the peaks are more distant, I have slower notes. So the duration is actually telling a story about uh, how frantic or, or dramatic is the, uh, uh, is, the, is the phenomenon. But also, I could use some, uh, again, that's science and technology coming, into help, coming to help. I can track the position in the, uh, the maximum energy in the spectrum. And for example, if you have an eruption, you have a big peak of energy, and, and the, the big peak in then decays and, and goes down. And if, if I can map the position of the, uh, of the energy, the maximum energy in the spectrum to uh, a music pitch, what I have is a melody that is following exactly the same story of the energy. So if you have a release, because I, my geyser is, um, is erupting and then is decreasing, I can actually have a melody doing, showing exactly that kind of profile. But that's enough of me talking. Why don't we listen to that? So, and I will ask so Alice again to uh, play some music coming from the, um, uh, the uh, old faithful uh, geyser converted into music. Thank you very much. And so that was the Old Faithful. And let's give something completely different now, Mudpot. We have very different kind of patterns. So you have a big eruption and then slow release, heavier burst. You have this bubble that are releasing very quickly their energy. And there are a lot of very similar, but always different uh, little stories that are told uh, by, by this. Uh, so, mud pots. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Uh, that was Smartpot. So something very, very different. And it, in some way, we can almost in a picture in our, in our mind the, this public thing compared to the big uh, eruption and then big release of energy of the, of the, uh, of the geyser. But let's go to the new things. So the main reason we are, we are here today is to make some new music. So this is, by definition, a, a world premiere. Uh, and it's a near real time uh, Yellowstone seismogram certification. So we are nervous, excited about this because what you are going to play today now is, a, you know, is up on what nature is doing in Yellowstone as we speak, essentially. Uh, so why doing this? Well, Yellowstone is one of the most active seismic areas in the, the, uh, in the US and in the world. There are between 15,000, 25,000, sorry, 1,500, 2,500 earthquakes per year in, uh, in that region. The majority of them are so small that we cannot perceive, but the instruments can record. And there is a network of almost uh, 50 seismometers that are connected there, and it's called the Yellowstone Seismic Network. Almost half of them are actually clustered together. They appear in this worm, as they're called, technically. And that's something pretty unique of Yellowstone. It is because of the orographies, of the because of the, of the uh, size of the volcano. So that means that earthquakes are coming one after the other or superimposed, and some of them can last for one, two days. Others can last for months. So you have like a continuous uh, stream of earthquakes. So you know, if you're lucky, we're, we're going to capture one today, and we are going to convert it into music and play it. Uh, I just would like to show you where we are in the map. So we are going to uh, get data from this seismogram, seismograph, seismometer here, uh, and I'm going to show you what we are going to do. We're going to stream data using the network from Yellowstone to here, uh, and that's, you know, we are looking at the last 15 minutes, to be precise, uh, and then we map that to music notes. That's exactly what Kepler did. And then the, from the music notes, we can actually create a music score, and what I will do, I'll just email that to Alisa now, and, uh, uh, and then I'll leave the floor to Alisa that will uh, comment on the score, and then play the score live uh, for us, and talking about the way she's interpreting and the kind of story she would like to tell using, uh, using this technique. So I'm leaving the presentation, and I'm moving on, the, on my software here. So this is the, so I'm getting data from the USGS, so the US Geophysical Survey. I'm running my program that is retrieving data, and that is the very interesting shape of the oscillation now. You know, we have to deal with that. So uh, I see Elisa smiling, so that, that, that's a good sign. Uh, so good, so this is the, that's the music. I get the file here, and I can show you it's modified today 1537, which is now. So that's the file. I'm representing that as a music score, which is this one, and I'm creating a PDF from that. Live score. And I'm going to mail it down to Elisa. Then score should be coming your way. And then I leave the floor to you, Elisa. So that's the illustration now. While I'm waiting for the score to arrive, um, I'll just share kind of what our plan with this is. <clears throat> so I will get the score as soon as it arrives and then play a chunk of it, probably not the full thing, perhaps the first page or so. Um, just straight as written. And so the first presentation that you and I will get on this is just the notes played mechanically um, without any artistic interpretation. 
Um, after that, after I've had a chance to at least go through it that once, um, then my plan is to see if there's anything I can bring out expressive in, in the name of expression, in the name of artistry. And so there'll be changing patterns. Um, I do have the score now. I have it in front of me. It looks like you folks can see it as well. It looks like there's going to be places of things that are more like arpeggios, places of things that are more like scales. Um, there might be different harmonies and tonalities that are suggested. And so um, the second go round of this, we'll try to add artistry and start adding more of the music telling component to it. Okay, so I do have the score up. Just give me a moment to make it a bit bigger. All right, and here we go. So we're going to do the sight reading and premiere of it played mechanically just as written. about through thank you so that was right about through the downbeat of measure 26 um i chose to stop there because that was a nice implied cadence got us back to um what sounded like a minor which is where the piece began one thing that's very interesting about this to me is this reminds me a lot of a very famous piece that johann sebastian bach wrote for solo flute um in the sense that uh, he wrote a multi-movement partita, the first movement of which is in complete rhythmic um, unison. It is all 16th notes. There are no, um, there's no variation to the rhythm. And I remember learning that when I was younger and finding it challenging um, to learn how to add artistry and expression when the rhythm gave you no character. And so it's very interesting because this music kind of suggests that. So one thing I noticed right away is even though these are all running eighth notes, and the data is just presenting everything in the same rhythm, there's a changing sense of pulse and meter based on where the notes repeat. So sometimes we're repeating notes by two, three, and four. So we do have some lovely moments of chemiola that give us a changing sense of pulse. Um, another thing that's interesting is where there are some smooth sort of almost wave-like gestures, things that would lend themselves well, musically speaking or flutistically speaking, to slurring or more expressive passages versus places where there's more repetition in the notes that would imply a little more dance-like, a little bit more clear, biting articulation. And so I'm gonna play that same chunk once more. I'm gonna add some of those um, considerations. So I'm gonna to start to phrase with those things in mind. I'm also gonna to try to be mindful of places that sound like the ends of phrases or cadences. And I'm gonna notice those mostly by probably arrival points on key notes such as A, maybe C and E, because a lot of this piece seems to be centering around an A minor arpeggio, which implies that um, the end of a phrase may happen when we reach one of those pitches. So I'm gonna go for measures one through 26 once more and start to try to add a bit more expression um, and artistry to it.
that sounds absolutely great. And I, it's so interesting to say, we, 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 did, we did this this morning, I say, like dress rehearsal for today. And this morning was like G major. That was completely different. It was really G major. You can actually see cadences. You can see the, the structure was very different. And this is clearly a minor with lots of very nicely written and minor things, which is, which is really, really fascinating. Uh, and thank you so much, Lisa, for, uh, for this. And um, uh, I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, again, we, uh, we wanted to do the, this little experiment with you and, uh, and try to do exactly what, in our life, as a scientist and artist, we, we work with data. Take, take data, we, we work on, uh, on creating the right mapping algorithms, and then we work a lot on the interpretation, what kind of story we can, we can tell with the, with the data. So going back to my presentation, um, the, the, the platform we use to, uh, to, uh, to connect and stream that is a, is a open source video conferencing platform called EduMeet. Uh, and EduMeet has been developed by the RNE community uh, in Europe, so in, by Giant, for uh, the community. It's an open source, everybody can install it. Uh, is, you just need a Linux machine, you can even just have a powerful laptop and install it there, and you have your own, uh, your own deployment. One thing I really like about Edumit is that if you are recording it and one of the participants doesn't want to, you know, doesn't agree or doesn't want to be recorded, it's only that audio and video stream that doesn't go into recording, but everybody else can be recorded, while Zoom and the teams there is either everybody or have to agree or nobody, which I think is quite nice. So we, it has been developed with the, uh, with the latest privacy regulation, so it's complying with the GDPR, for example, in Europe, uh, but it has the, the user at its heart. Uh, and it's using the, uh, the high quality uh, Opus Codex, you can choose a conference mode or a hi-fi hi -fi mode. Uh, and um, the, there are no trackers, there is no software installation, there is no uh, you know, plugins to have. You just, you know, just in the browser, you can use your iPhone, you can use your uh, a tablet, you can use a laptop. Um, so you can just, it just work. And if you want to try to do what we did today, you just go to edumeet.gen.org uh, and then you can just choose a name. For example, we use CX2023, and that's the, the room we are using with, with Alisa at the moment. Uh, so it won't be using a European host system. Um, but we also have a first trial US-based version called usa.edumeet.edu. So you can just go there, uh, and it's asking you two things. Create a room name. It, pro it suggests you a random one, but you can put one for you. Uh, and then your, your username. You click and you, are, and you are online. And you just share the same URL with everybody else. You can lock the room, you can record, you can share files, uh, and you can select the um, so conference audio or hi-fi hi -fi audio. Uh, so give it a try. Let us, let us know um, uh, how, you, you, know, how you, you, know, you feel using it, because uh, it's all good feedback that we can then refer to our developers and because we own it as a community, we can make it better the way we need, and not just based on some like market-driven uh, requirement. So I like that you know, all this seems to suggest that technology is one of the most powerful enabler of innovation in the arts. But also, I was, my favorite thing is that art seems to continuously challenge technology. And that is an example, but you know, when tele the telegraph was invented in 1840, and the first lines were put on the, on the ground on, over long distance in the 1860, it only took a few years to somebody like Alicia Gray to create a method, a system to use the telegraph to transmit music signal, well, the control signal, having a keyboard and a telegraph. The telegraph was not invented to transmit music, but the artists were so eager to get their performance outside the concert room, they used whatever they could, telegraph. Or in 1897, Tadeusz Cahill invented the telharmonium. At that time, loudspeakers were not even invented. There was no loudspeaker as we know. The only thing that could actually play something 
was a carbon transducer in a telephone. So what this guy did was creating a massive, gigantic, <laughs> big synthesizer. And can you see that little telephone on the, on, the, on the stool there? Well, you could actually, at that time, that was Swiss old in New York City, you can actually ring that number, and you can call that guy and say, can you, sorry, I can't sleep, can you play some Colbert variation for me? And they will play it for you. You know, we are in 2023, we don't have anything like that today. I can't ring anybody and say, can you please play that for me? And he was playing on, on the telephone, and the signal was getting on the other line, and it was the only thing we could actually hear, he was able to play something, was the telephone. Art is challenging technology, is inspiring technology. I think that was absolutely brilliant, 1867. It didn't work, well, it worked for a perfectly well, then the only reason why it stopped being used is because it was so powerful that it was, when it was used, the actual normal telephone line was so, <laughs> you know, it was like a bandwidth issue and the telephone line was actually unusable and so people stopped using it. But the same principle used by the telharmonium was the, the one that the um, Robert, so sorry, Hammond, uh, then miniaturized in the Hammond organ. So if you like this, if you like listen, hearing more about technology and art together, uh, on behalf of Andoil, Internet2, and Giant, we'd like to invite you to uh, the Network Performing Art Production Workshop that Internet2 and Giant, uh, with some partners like the New World Symphony, uh, organize uh, regularly, so every year, and every other year is hosted in the, in the US and in Europe. And it's an annual gathering of uh, music, musicians, technicians, uh, music educators, scientists, uh, technologists uh, that use advanced network to enable art tuition, instruction, instruction, master classes, multi-site performances. Uh, Edumit was one of the things that were a uh, trial there. Uh, and this year is going to be uh, hosted by the uh, University of Memphis. Uh, and it will be in September, uh, from the 6th of 8th of September. So let us know if you would like to come, if you have, uh, I think we are opening soon the call for proposals, so if you have some idea you'd like to, you'd like to share, or for a performance, or for a talk, of course you are most welcome. And I'd like to conclude with a, with a little clip from uh, last uh, MPAPW that was in, uh, uh, in Estonia, uh, and this is, using another system called Lola as, again, something that was created by musicians for musicians, so in the, in, within our community of research and education. Uh, and this is the two countries, Lithuania and Estonia, playing together, connected with a high policy audio video link. And it's Avo part. Thank you.
can we have <coughs> at least on the screen as well so we can answer questions? Yes. Can you hear me? There we yes. Go. Um, so I thought it was really interesting. You pointed out the uh, the mud pot piece uh, was reminiscent of a Beethoven piece because I believe traditionally Beethoven was really influenced by nature and sounds around him, and like even the Fifth Symphony was inspired by a bird call. Those first few notes. Um, I'm wondering if it would be possible to kind of reverse engineer some of those pieces in history and see if there are maybe data points that match up with portions of of things that were happening in that area or things that they said they were inspired by, that you could maybe use that going the opposite direction and see if you could maybe pull data out of music pieces that were inspired by nature, as opposed to using nature to inspire music pieces. I think that's a very interesting idea. Uh, I think somebody tried something like, like that, like reverse engineer uh, music to see whether it was. But the reason they did that was mostly to look at patterns or how they how they, they created that. Oh. Uh, and I think the missing step was how that pattern was, was actually related to the nature and the environment around the composer. And that's, I think, something quite, quite interesting. Yes, I agree with you. It would be a fascinating study. I, uh, that was great, by the way. Um, I, I apologize if I've missed this, because I realized that you had mentioned some of the data points um, dictating uh, like the tempo and the rhythm of the pieces. How, how is our, like I saw you used Art Studio, how does that mapping to actual notes on the scale? Is it frequencies, or how is that, or an algorithm? How is that done? Um, I actually have both. Uh, <laughs> in, my, in my argument, I, uh, I, I have a map to frequency, uh, and I, so for, for which I use an exponential mapping. Or I'm using, in this case, is a linear mapping to MIDI nodes. So the, uh, one, so the graph that you, you see here is the, um, oh, isn't that one? Uh, one, one of the graphs that I, uh, I showed in the, in the little window was, uh, was the actual quantization of the of the waveform to MIDI nodes, given the scale. Uh, I can actually change the scale as well. So I could have asked Alisa, which scale would you like? Uh, and I, I can actually create different sonification depending on the scale. So I use diatonic, I can use chromatic, uh, melodic, I can use uh, Lydian, mixolydian, uh, every kind of, organic, even microtonal, of course, if you, if you want. Thank you. Other questions? If not, thank you very, very much for, for being, being with us today. Thank you, Alisa, for playing. Good. And hopefully, see you in September in Memphis.